Um, we now have something, I think, really very special and unique for you. It's my very great privilege to introduce Mrs. Fanny Hugill. Um, what can I say about her? Well, what better than that she was actually there. She was with Admiral Ramsey in Portsmouth and afterwards, um, and she is going to share some of her personal memories and recollections with us. But before she does, let me just embarrass her a little bit. Um, um, because, of course, the one thing that, as a young Wren on duty on the night of the 5th and 6th of June that she didn't know was that her soon-to-be husband was also embarked for Normandy, or about to embark for Normandy, and actually, I believe, went in on D-Day plus one. And that was Tony Hugill, whose papers we're very proud to have in the Archive Centre, including his D-Day diary, which those of you who are able to come to the display later um, will be able to see. But uh, without further ado, let me introduce Mrs. Fanny Hugel. very much, Alan, for your kind words, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honoured to be here, um, part of the symposium in memory of Admiral Ramsey. As a very, very junior Wren officer, straight out of Greenwich, I was appointed as personal assistant to Admiral Tennant. We've heard about him earlier, well known to Ramsey, of course, and on Ramsey's staff planning the invasion, he was in charge of a very important part of the operation, the Marbury Harbors and the Pluto Pipeline, and he was known universally to everybody as Ramp. He had a personal staff of three at Norfolk House, St. James's Square, and a further team of specialists who were involved in the construction and the design of the Marby Harbors and the Pluto Pipeline. And I turned up at Norfolk House, February 44, this is, uh, and to my surprise, there were American uh, marine sentries on the door wearing white gloves in all the, the grime of the bombing. Security was extraordinarily light to look back on it. Uh, one of my very first jobs was to dust the uh, beautifully made model of the invasion beaches, which was housed in a, in a room. Uh, beautifully made. It was housed on a kitchen table. Uh, but the key to this room lay in my unlocked desk drawer. <laughs> I was the only rep on Ram's, Ram's team. The work was fascinating, unfamiliar. The days were very long and the nights disturbed by air raids. So when, uh, towards the end of April, uh, staff packed up and moved to the country, this came as a very welcome relief. And we went to uh, Southwark Park, HMS Dryad, behind Portsmouth. And uh, for the first time, to use a modern phrase, the staff began to bond. We had not had time or inclination in London to really get to know each other well, to make friends, uh, to do the usual things like go to the pub or go for a walk. So we did all that and that was, that was extraordinarily agreeable and we made friends for life. Southwark Park resembled a village. There were about a hundred Nissan huts in orderly rows also vehicles of every description, uh, tents well concealed under the fine trees. And 
we had been warned before we went there that we were going to be at very close quarters, and this was an understatement. Uh, Ramp's staff was squeezed into a little sort of erstwhile dressing room, very uncomfortable, and 60, 60 Ren officers were housed in three bedrooms at the top of Southwark House, and I don't think I'd better mention the ablutions. Um, I have to say that my job was going to come to an end because once the invasion started, I was very unlikely to stay with ANCXF. So rather cheekily, I put in for a transfer to work in the ops room, what we call the ops room, what of course is now the map room. Um, and Admiral Tennant, with great generosity, released me and replaced me. So I walked downstairs very happily to take up my old job. I had been a plotter at Dover as a rating. The weather was absolutely glorious. The Whit Bank holiday weekend was very, very hot. We sunbathed on the roof of Southwark House. And for the first time, pressure of work began to ease. There was really no more time to tweak Operation Overlord. And the endless, endless hours of typing which were engendered, that was finished. And Ramsey suggested cricket. And this went down extremely well. And two matches were played, one between the girls and the sailors and one between the senior mess and the Wren officers. Both matches that the Wrens was soundly beaten despite being handicapped. They played, of course, in their skirts with their ties tucked into their shirts and their sleeves rolled up. One of my friends was a good cricketer and uh, a lethal bowler underarm. Ramsey played himself and recorded in his diary he made 16 runs and was very stiff. I think it's worth just describing briefly the ops room because, of course, today it doesn't look tall as it looked then. Uh, against the wall, opposite the wall map, uh, the liaison officers sat at very rickety little tables. That was the Army, the Air Force, and the Americans. The long wall opposite the windows was entirely covered with useful information, uh, weather reports, tides, moons, all that sort of thing, and banks of clipboards which contained the endless stream of signals, current signals, were filed on that wall. There were two plots, the big wall plot, which we know so well, and also a table plot, which was always had a pair of uh, dividers and parallel rulers on it, so staff could uh, work out tricky problems. Uh, there was also a small switchboard very awkwardly placed at an angle towards the back of the room and loose cables all over the floor. Um, Staff-wise, there was always uh, a duty commander, a duty lieutenant, three rounds, one man in the switchboard, one plotter updating the plot, and me. And I acted as a sort of uh, receptionist dog's body, I suppose. I answered any unattended telephones. I accepted and read incoming signals and onward routed them to the right place. And um, I found it absolutely fascinating because, of course, everybody, as they walked into Southwark House, past the door of 
the ops room. So people used to look in, all the top brass looked in, updated themselves before they went on to their meetings. Uh, security was tighter than in London. Uh, there were two armed Royal Marine sentries on the door. There was another uh, sentry outside the ops room and yet another up on the first floor outside Admiral Ramsey's office, which I think must have been the main bedroom of the house when it was a private house uh, and which was used as a meeting room. But as we all know, the weather didn't last. And because of the postponement of the day by 24 hours, I found myself on watch the night of the 5th, 6th June. Night watch lasted from 11 o'clock night until 8 o'clock the following morning. Um, the ops room could get crowded and hot. Nobody ever took their jackets off. And on that particular night, the wind, the gale, rattled the shutters, the wooden shutters, which were the only and very efficient form of blackout. People began to drift off to bed after I uh, went on watch. Admiral Creasy, Admiral Ramsey's chief of staff, stayed up all night. He had a chair strategically placed in the middle of the room so that he could watch everything going on. Um, and to be absolutely truthful, after our tremendous efforts and efforts of a lot of people over a very long time, the night was something of an anticlimax. I went into breakfast, morning of the 6th, and the wireless in the mess was on, to report that the invasion had started, which of course I knew. And later that day, King George VI broadcast. It was a particularly somber message to the nation, almost as though he wanted to be certain that if things went wrong, if things didn't go according to plan, the nation would be prepared. It's worth reading if you ever get the chance. And in very few days' time, returning staff who'd been across to Normandy came back with uh, presents for the mess. And for the first time in my life, I tasted brie, cheese, and armagnac. <laughs> but it was not until the first week of September that we packed up again and crossed the channel and one of the most exciting moments of my life was to land on a Marlbury at Aramash. We then had two weeks in Normandy and packed up again and went to Saint-Germain-en-Laye, driving through devastated towns and villages. I mean, we were used to destruction at home, but this was something else. Our headquarters at Chateau Denmark in saint germain laye were not far from Chafe at Versailles. And we settled down there and we celebrated Christmas. It was a vile winter, awful. We were all issued with duffel coats. Um, and then we celebrated New Year. The youngest wren on the team rang in the new year on the ship's bell. And then on the morning of the 2nd of January came the shattering news of the crash of Admiral Ramsey's Hudson aircraft and all, all, all five on board had been killed. We were accustomed to bad news. It was, the war had gone on for a very long time. 
But the staff had been together for what seemed ages, and we were like a family. So to lose five like that, and we knew all five extremely well, that was tragic. We were not allowed, of course, to talk about it, and so disciplined were we that this was carried out. We didn't chatter among ourselves. And the funerals were arranged to take place at the Nouvelle Cimetière in saint germain laye And work went on. Somebody found a cushion. Somebody else sewed Admiral Ramsey's medals onto it. And on the morning of the funeral, Behind the five coffins charged the top brass. They were all there. Duff Cooper was the ambassador. The French watched curiously. They had no idea what had happened. Behind the top brass came the complete members of the complete staff. Uh, you couldn't march. It was much too treacherous underfoot. Wrens lined the five empty graves. Apart from our own chaplain, there was an American army rabbi with his prayer shawl round over his uniform shoulders. One of the five had been a Jew. Back at our chateau, we held our own very private service. We felt the loss of Admiral Ramsey very, very deeply. A lot of us, including myself, had been at Dover and had known him. We not only treated him with respect, but with affection, devotion, and total loyalty. It isn't the luck of many people to have served under a real leader, but that's what he was. The war was far from over, and it was in... We celebrated VE Day in May. I danced in the Place de la Concorde that night. And in June, we had packed up and had our final move to Germany. And now, today, we're all here, which is a wonderful tribute to somebody who really didn't get the notice that he deserved in years gone by. And I can say with pride that I was a Ramsey Wren.